difficult to work back there. We're probably going to have to build some road to, uh, to complete this investigation. I understand that the two black boxes have been retrieved. Is that right? That's correct. They have been retrieved and they will be sent back to Washington and uh, start the uh, readout process as soon as possible. Weather conditions were 37 degrees with rain and fog as the plane prepared to land in Raleigh-Durham. Any indication initially if weather was a factor? No, there's no indication at this point of anything in this investigation. I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, we are literally just assembling the team and getting it organized, and it'll be some time until we develop the basic facts here. What can you tell us about the, the specific model of plane that went down, the Jetstream Super 31? <clears throat> well, there isn't much that I can tell you at this point. We'll be assembling those records and looking at all of that in the context of uh, what we develop here. Um, there have been previous accidents, as there are with most airplanes, but I don't think it's been a remarkable record in that regard. Uh, it, it, but again, before any of that makes any sense, we have to understand what happened in this specific case, and that's the first order of priority. The NTSB recently recommended some stricter uh, safety standards for commuter planes that would go into effect sometime late next year. Yet, uh, according to American Eagle, the company already adheres to these stricter safety standards. So what difference will they make? Well, that's correct. In, in this case, uh, American Eagle has operated under Part 121 for some considerable period of time. Uh, again, in order to make any sense of that, we have to understand the specific facts that were at play here. And uh, until such time as we develop those, we can't put that in the context of any of the recommendations that we made in the recent commuter safety study. As you well know, people are fairly nervous about flying commuter planes. Uh, right. The International Passengers <laughs> Association advised the public to avoid commuter aircraft, uh, warning that they are not safe, they are in fact dangerous. How do you feel about that recommendation? Well, I disagree with that uh, statement as it stands. Uh, the numbers that they talk about include operations from Alaska, they include helicopters, they include other kinds of operations. If in fact you restrict the comparison to uh, aircraft operated in the lower 48 in scheduled carrier um, operations, the safety record for these airlines is, is comparable to that enjoyed by the majors, and, and both are very good. John Lauber, the National Transportation Safety Board, thanks very much for talking with us, sir. You're welcome. Investigators will, of course, be talking with eyewitnesses, no doubt. They'll be speaking with Sue Phillips. She was enjoying a quiet evening with her family when the American Eagle plane crashed near her home. That's where Mrs. Phillips is this morning. Mrs. Phillips, good morning. Thanks for talking with us this morning. Good morning. Let me start from the beginning. Tell me what you heard. Um, we were at home sitting down, and my husband was on the phone, and we just heard a thump upstairs, just what I heard, what I thought was a thump upstairs, a loud thump, the children playing up there. And about a minute or two later, a neighbor came and said, did you hear that noise? And I said, yeah, I thought it was the kids. It shook the house. He said, no, it was a, an explosion that we thought at a brickyard. So my husband and, and um, this man went up to the brickyard, and, and then while they were gone, I dialed 911 to tell them we had heard an explosion, but I had not heard the um, siren go off from the fire department yet. I wanted to make sure that somebody knew something was going on out here and said, yes, ma'am, there was a plane crash. When you, got to the, when you got to the scene, Sue, what did you see? Oh, my goodness. Um, when I got to the scene, uh, we got there to begin with, and there were a few rescue workers there. I went up, my husband and I went up there, and I said, listen, um, if you need some help, we're here. If not, we'll get out of the way. And they said, yeah, we need some help. So we went down there, and what I saw were a lot of people and a lot of pain that needed a lot of help. And that's exactly what we did. We jumped in. We did what we could for them. You, we did basic first aid and helped the rescue workers out as much as possible. We held hands and we prayed a lot. Your expertise, uh, Sue, certainly came in handy because you're, you're a nurse, correct? Yes, but I didn't do anything else that anybody else wouldn't do in that situation. You saw bleeding. You stopped bleeding. People were having difficulty breathing. You assisted them getting positioned so they could breathe better. I did nothing more than what anybody else would, would do in that situation. I understand emergency vehicles really couldn't get that close to the crash site, so you would have to transport many of the survivors to ambulances nearby. Is that correct? Yes. Um, what we did is we put them on boards that had handles that um, the the men could carry him out on. We got him stabilized on these boards. Then we went through um, the woods, which was muddy and dark and trees and, and, and logs, everything just in the way. And, and these 
these men were just so exhausted. They worked so hard. And then my husband and other people brought four-wheel drive vehicles down, down a hill, back up a hill. Um, oh, it was, it was just awful. And put them in the back of the pickup trucks, and then they drove through all this mud, field slosh and everything Gosh. to get these people up to the ambulance. There was one particularly upsetting situation with a man who was searching for his wife. Is that right? Yeah. It was. It, I, I think you know his name anyway. It's John. I'll say his name is John. And bless his heart, he was. He was. He, he was. He was doing okay. He was stable, but his heart was broken, and he just needed somebody there to hold his hand and reassure him. And I, I couldn't tell him anything about his wife because I had no idea at all. All I could do was just hold his hand and help him out the best I could, well, and say a little prayer for him. I know you say you would be doing, you, you did what anybody would do in that situation, but Sue, you did incredible work, and I'm sure people really appreciated your presence there. The whole there. community pulled together. It wasn't just me or one other person. It was everybody together doing what we could to help out a few folks that needed help. Well, Sue Phillips, thank you very much, Sue. You're welcome. Bryant. All right, Katie. Ned Clark is a highly regarded aviation safety consultant who has investigated plane crashes for almost 30 years now. This morning, he's in Lexington Park, Maryland. Mr. Clark, good morning. Good morning. Based on what little information we have, what's your early take on this crash? Well, it's an approach to landing accident, and statistically, uh, the, the two main causes of that have been severe weather, like microbursts, which are associated with thunderstorms, and the second has been pilot error. So statistically, that's what we're looking at. Uh, it doesn't reflect necessarily on this accident, but uh, that's, that's where we are. Does it seem to you, given the information we have, that weather was not a factor? Uh, I think in the we're, by weather, we're probably thinking in terms of icing conditions, and my review of the weather says that uh, the icing probably wasn't uh, a cause, and we didn't have uh, any reason to believe that there were severe updrafts or downdrafts, which are normally associated with thunderstorms. So weather may have been a factor, but I don't think it's going to be the overwhelming factor in this case. The wreckage is supposedly in two distinct parts in a concentrated area. What does that suggest? Uh, to me, it suggests a uh, relatively controlled uh, accident. The fact that we have so many survivors, uh, and that type of uh, uh, environment says that the aircraft was, was essentially flown into the ground. The frequency of these crashes, uh, Mr. Clark, is understandably alarming a great deal of, of the flying public. Are we resigned to the fact that, must we be resigned to the fact commuter airlines are just plain unsafe? A guard has crashed today into a Fresno apartment building. Early reports indicate at least two, perhaps three people are dead and as many as 20 injured. The plane reportedly was a twin-engine Learjet leased to the California Air National Guard, which has a base at the Fresno Airport. Federal aviation officials say the pilot had declared an emergency, but seemed to overfly the runway at Fresno Airport. It was, it was very frightening. Um, the plane was coming west on um, Olive Avenue. The pilot kept the plane, you know, on the street. It hit the stoplight at our corner of Chestnut and Olive, and. Uh, Right beside us, there's a me and Ed that hit that, the sign there, which at that time is when it exploded. And the, uh, it sounded like a bomb going off. Yeah, this building just shook. And uh, then the plane, as it was going west, it started tumbling and landed on the cars by that apartment and hit that apartment. I came out running and then some lady that was all burned up from the apartment, she ran to my house and we put blankets on her. And she was all full of blood, her skin was all peeling and everything. And then um, we had blankets on her, we let them use the phone call, the paramedics call her mother or something. And then I thought about my car, so I took off running to the park, and the guys broke into her, her back. And her house was on fire and everything, but we don't know what happened to her. And then I came out here to the street part, and I seen all kinds of like pieces of the jet. You saw that burning apartment complex. One person died in there. The pilot is dead. And now we learn from a radio report that a person was killed in a car next to the apartment building. Additionally, 20 people injured in the Fresno mishap. Officials still don't know why an American Eagle plane crashed last night in North Carolina. The Transportation Department today announced it will add 300 inspectors to check all passenger planes. More on the crash in North Carolina from Jenny West. Transportation Secretary Federico Pena and FAA Administrator Dave Hinson showed up at the crash site today. 
They were unable, though, to get a first-hand look at the wreckage. The 500-foot-long wooded site is heavily quarantined. Investigators are trudging through the ankle-deep muck in search of aircraft pieces that might hold the key to why American Eagle Flight 3379 went down on approach to Raleigh-Durham Airport Tuesday evening. This latest crash is raising the level of concern among federal officials about safety in commuter aviation. We're very much expecting that this year was going to be the safest year for the commuter airline industry. Any time we have an accident of this kind, it is of great concern to us. There were 20 people aboard the Jetstream Super 31 turboprop aircraft when it crashed in fog and rain. 13 were dead at the site. Seven others were rushed to area hospitals where two more died en route. Miraculously, five people did survive. Sue Phillips was one of the first Good Samaritans to come to the aid of the victims. These, these folks were just shaking, just cold, nothing else, they were cold. I took my coat off, I gave it to them, I wrapped them up in it. I found tarp where we were just laying in the ground, we wrapped them up, whatever we could, and just to make them more comfortable till we could transport them. The flight data and cockpit reporters have been recovered and sent back to Washington. Aviation officials hope they shed more light on the mystery of the crash of American Eagle Flight 3379. We have no idea what may have caused this accident. There were no radio transmissions of trouble last night from the airplane, no indications of any problems from the flight crew. The pilot and co-pilot had more than 7,000 hours of flight time between them. This was the second American Eagle crash in the past two months. There may be at least a few answers this evening when federal officials hold their first major briefing on this crash. Jenny West, CNN, Morrisville, North Carolina. Amtrak is American Eagle, Eagle aircraft including a Halloween night crash which killed 68 people. That night, American Eagle Flight 4184 crashed in a soybean field near Roselawn, Indiana. It was on approach to Chicago's O'Hare Airport from Indianapolis when it disappeared from radar during a heavy rainstorm. All 64 passengers and four crew members were killed. The plane was an ATR-72, a different type of plane than the one which went down last night near Raleigh. Investigators are still trying to determine the exact cause of the crash, but they suspect it was a buildup of ice on the wings. A month ago today, an American Eagle plane lost a cockpit hatch as it took off from Kennedy Airport in New York City. They said, um, we, uh, we have a problem, nothing to panic about. He says, uh, we have a hatch, uh, we can't fly without it, so we're going to go back and land. That aircraft landed safely and no one was hurt. Then, eight days ago, an American Eagle plane was forced to make an emergency landing in Chicago after a warning light indicated a problem with the plane's de-icing equipment. The plane landed safely, and it was determined there was no problem, just a broken indicator light. However, last Friday, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered that ATR aircraft, like the one which crashed in Indiana, may no longer fly in icy weather. The FAA says those planes may still be flown in non-icy conditions. In the last seven years, American Eagle has had a total of six fatal crashes, among them a 1988 flight which crashed at the Raleigh Airport, killing all 12 people on board. And we have more details for you now on the safety of commuter airlines. Last year, commuter airlines had Certificates which are part of the settlement of a massive price-fixing lawsuit. But don't spend it all in one place. Channel 2 Consumer Advisor Clark Howard joins us with more. That's true. You're not going to get a ton of money. The suit was filed back in 1990 and claimed airlines were using computerized reservation systems to fix ticket prices. The airlines denied any wrongdoing but settled out of court. The certificates will be in the mail beginning tomorrow. The discount coupons will be going out in the mail starting tomorrow and travelers will be able to use them as soon as they get them. But there are certain restrictions. Robert Richards, a businessman from Honolulu, says he filed for a significant amount of business travel, but that it's difficult to tell if it's really going to do him any good. Because there's so many restrictions um, on the coupons that you got back. In terms of air travel out of Honolulu, when there's discount fares, I may be able to get one flight out of it, but it's essentially worthless. However, Dawn Smith, the special administrative master of the action, says that those airline travelers who filed are getting the best deal possible. The court made it very clear um, in approving the settlement that he felt the class was benefiting um, as opposed to the class proceeding to trial and very likely not winning anything at all. Travelers we spoke with today who'd filed said they're looking forward to their certificates. We have 
couple of thousand dollars in the airline? $3,500 in tickets. So we're expecting a sizable return. If you flew less than five times during the period of January 88 through June 92, you'll receive a total of $73 in certificates. If you flew at least five times but spent under $2,500, you'll get a discount certificate worth $79. For those with claims over $2,500, the certificates will be for $79 or more. Many travelers feel something's better than nothing. I mean, if we get anything out of the deal, it's a positive thing. You can't use your certificates all at once, and they come with quite a few restrictions. They're in mice type on the back of the certificates. Look at yours as found money, not a free ride. And remember this, the airlines love this because you have to spend in the crash. Dedicated, determined, dependable. This is Channel 5 Eyewitness News at 6. Good evening, I'm Brenda Wood. And I'm Jim Axel. A twin-engine Learjet leased a spewing flaming fuel on a line of cars. Three people confirmed dead. Ken Watts has been following the story. He joins us with the latest from our newsroom. Ken? Jim, it is a scene of destruction where a plane went down in the middle of a neighborhood. Authorities say it was a Learjet leased by the military. Now, reports from our CNN affiliate in Fresno indicate the pilot and co-pilot of the plane were killed in the crash. The third victim is believed to be someone who was getting into their car. Many residents were able to escape the burning building, but others were trapped inside. We're just like looking and looking, and then all of a sudden the plane just came down. down. We she got stuck in there in, in the apartment with the one that's caught on fire. It was just, it just all happened so all of a sudden. So far, rescue crews on the scene confirmed 20 people are critically injured. Firefighters believe people could still be trapped inside the smoldering apartment complex. The fire has been put out. 18 units have been damaged along with other buildings in the area. Again, three people are confirmed dead, including the pilot and co-pilot. We will have the latest developments on this continuing story throughout the hour. Brenda? All right, Ken, thanks. The California crash comes just a day after a fatal plane crash here on the East Coast. An American Eagle commuter plane went down last night in North Carolina. An Atlanta area man was among the 15 people killed. In our team coverage this evening, Mary Ellen Resendez reports from the victim's home in Kennesaw, where his family was just notified of his death. But first, Sharon Crowley is in North Carolina at the scene of the crash. Sharon? Brenda, we're told in just about an hour the National Transportation and Safety Board will be having a press briefing. Hopefully they'll be able to shed some light on exactly how this crash happened. Now, investigators have been out here at the scene all day. They've been rummaging through debris trying to find some answers themselves about what happened here. Now, 15 people were killed in that crash, but there were, thankfully, some survivors. My first impression of this is that this is our little miracle. Diane Lewis feels hope tonight, even though her husband is still and in critical condition. He's concerned about the kids that we have, and he's concerned about, he was concerned about his other co-worker and wanted to express something to me about his other co-worker. He was sorry for the death of his co-worker. The Lewises are from Illinois. Ronald Lewis was on a business trip. He was one of five survivors of American Eagle Flight 3379. The commuter jet crashed last night in a wooded area in Morrisville, North Carolina. Doctors say several of the passengers are still in intensive care. These are all what we consider blunt injuries. It's impossible to uh, tell what contact was made between the patient and what particular contents of the aircraft. Investigators still don't know what caused the crash. They're looking at weather conditions and possible pilot error. Meanwhile, family members of survivors like Diane Lewis say they don't want to think about what's been lost, just what they still have. And I have a husband for Christmas. And I have a father who's going to be there for my kids. Well, as we, as we told you earlier, the NTSB is planning to have a press briefing in just about an hour from now, and we will bring you more on exactly what they say in that briefing coming up tonight at primetime news at 10 o'clock. Reporting live from Morrisville, North Carolina, Sharon Crowley, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. Sharon. Strong emotions in most of us. This one, well, it hits much harder for a Cobb County family. One of the crash victims was from Kennesaw, and tonight that family is trying to learn how to deal with grief. Channel 5's Mary Ellen Resendez joining us now with their story. Mary Ellen? 
Jim, we're standing outside the home of 38-year-old Dennis Elaine. Outside his door, a wreath of white carnations has been hung in his memory. The family says they still have received little information from American Eagle representatives. In fact, they waited in this home 13 hours before a representative came to see them. It was then that they found out that David Elaine was still alive when he was pulled from the crash. He was transported to a hospital, and there he died. I've always had the feeling that Dennis was one, and my sister did too because she was always worried that she should have been there and she didn't know it to be there. The news the American Eagle representative brought was like a dagger to the Elaine family. They were already trying to deal with the sudden death of 38-year-old Dennis Elaine. Now they wondered if they could have made it to the hospital to say goodbye. She took it hard. She took it real hard, just like any wife would. It, it came as a shock. He was a great person. He was good to us. You're right. I don't know if he was just there for us. <laughs> Deborah Lane says she first met Dennis in 1988. By 1990, they were married. He just took right to my kids. He didn't have any problem with the kids. Deborah Lane says for the past three years, Dennis Elaine traveled as a general contractor. He spent the last two months renovating a hotel in North Carolina. Last night, he boarded American Eagle Flight 3379 to Michigan. He was heading for another job. Problem. She was waiting for his phone call of a safe arrival when she received a doctor's call instead. About sometime around 12 o'clock or maybe a little after a doctor from the hospital called me and told me he was dead. Which I thought was amazing that they would just call and tell somebody that over the telephone. They should have a lot more compassion for the way the families feel about it. Christmas will never be the same for the Elaines. They can now only focus on bringing Dennis Elaine home to rest. When him and mom first got together, I was 16, 15, and he had done a lot to help me, you know. I just to bring him home. <laughs> At this time, there is no definite word as far as when David Elaine, or Dennis Elaine's body will be released to his family. His family is hoping it will be tomorrow. They're going to home in Canton, Georgia. Reporting live from Kennesaw, Mary Ellen, we're sent to Mary Ellen, you mentioned that Dennis Elaine did a lot of air traveling because of his business. Did he ever express to his family any concerns about his safety flying that much? No, he never did. In fact, he was quite comfortable with planes. His family says he grew up on planes. His father was a pilot for Pan American. Mary Ellen Resendez in Kennesaw. Thanks. Another victim of last night's crash was well known to bass fishermen. 1994 Bass Masters champion Brian Kirchhall was aboard flight 3379 when it went down. Kirchhall was the youngest person and first amateur ever to win the Bass Masters Classic, the top event on the Bass Angler Circuit. Kirchhall, a native of Newton, Connecticut, finished 33rd at a bass tournament at Lake Lanier earlier this month. Wrapping up now our coverage for now of the crash of American Eagle Flight 3379. Fifteen people were killed in last night's crash. The plane, a Jetstream Super 31, went down in fog, rainy and cold conditions and dense forest four miles from the Raleigh-Durham Airport. One of the victims was...